Right, um, welcome to our final session after a really fantastic two days of the Silic Rare Books and Special Collections Group Conference 2021. Um, it feels like we spent ages planning it and it's amazing it's gone by so fast. I've certainly had a lot of inspiring and thoughtful things to think about as a result of this conference. So um, just some housekeeping, please keep your microphone on mute and your camera off and please use the zoom chat if you would like to ask any questions rather than the hoover chat and um, if you're using social media please do tweet or um, instagram or facebook whatever did you do by us using the hashtag rbscg21 so after all these stimulating sessions about new science about best practices about new approaches to our collaborations about new research and stories that come out of them. This is a final panel discussion to reflect on what we've heard and begin the question, where next? What does all this mean for us rare book librarians? And we have three speakers who are going to give the perspective from three different kinds of libraries. And first of all, they'll speak for about five to 10 minutes to give their responses. And then we'll throw the floor open to questions. So to keep this session working primarily as a discussion between our speakers, um, I'd like to ask if you could, for this session, ask questions primarily through the chat, and then I'll field them onto the speakers. If you really do think it would be easier and clearer to speak rather than type, do raise your hand or otherwise signal that you'd like to speak. But the default in this session is that I'll read the questions in the chat out rather than call on speakers. And Jane Gallagher, who's hosting this session, will also chip in if she spots something I've missed. Um, if there's time at the end of this session, I'll also ask if anyone would like to share their own reflections, but otherwise we'll draw this session to a close at about a quarter past four and hand back over to our wonderful chair, Sarah Maherter, who'll bring our conference to a close. So um, I realize I haven't introduced myself, I'm Helen Vincent, I'm Head of Rare Books, Maps and Music at the National Library of Scotland, and I'm also a member of the Silip Rare Books and Special Collections Group Committee, where I'm currently our Ethics and Diversity Champion and represent Rare Books in Scotland. And I'm going to introduce our speakers in the order that they're going to first speak and then just plunge straight into their, um, uh, their reflections. But I'll just give a warning that one of our speakers, Laura Haggerty, has a bit of a dodgy internet connection today. So um, she might, um, we hope she'll be able to speak at the right moment. Um, and if not, Lara, when, when, we, when you're here, we'll get you to um, join in. I can see Lara's just arrived, but as she said to me, her connection might come and go throughout this afternoon. So it's great you're here anyway, Lara. I'm sure you'll make a great contribution when you can speak. So introducing our speakers, first of all, um, Daryl Green from the University of Edinburgh, where he's head of special collections and deputy head of the Centre for Research Collections, will give the perspective of an academic library. He's worked with special collections and cultural heritage collections in a number of higher education environments in the UK over the past um, 15 years, including rare books cataloging, collection manager, college librarian, and now in senior management. He's curated large and small exhibitions and has recently published on the role of copyright and permissions fees in UK special collections, and most recently on book exhibitions in a virtual environment. And Daryl's also just taken up the role of chair of the rare books and special collections section at IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations. And second will be Lara Haggerty, who has been keeper at the Library of Inner Pefre in rural Perthshire since 2009. Inner Pefre Library, which is a really fantastic place, if you ever get the chance to go and visit, was Scotland's first free public lending library and now combines the role of museum, reference collection and visitor attraction. Her role includes curating exhibitions and creating events to bring alive the collection to a wide variety of audiences, working with researchers and supervising volunteers and PhD students. Previously, Lara worked as an arts and heritage advisor for a local authority and as a manager and producer in touring theatre. And Lara will speak today from the perspective of a smaller institution. And finally, from very small to very big, Tanya Kirk at the British Library, 
where she's lead curator for printed heritage collections 1601 to 1900. And she's worked at the British Library for the past 13 years. A specialist in English literature, Tanya has co-curated five major exhibitions at the British Library, including Harry Potter, A History of Magic, Shakespeare in 10 Acts, and Terror and Wonder, The Gothic Imagination. So as I said, first of all, we'll hear from all three of our speakers, just giving their reflections on the conference so far. And we'll start with Daryl. Over to you, Daryl. Thank you. Ellen, uh, and thanks very much, everybody. Um, this has been a, a fascinating couple of days. Uh, and uh, for me, the variety has been really fantastic as well. Um, so uh, reflections uh, just in general, um, starting with uh, yesterday's uh, papers, especially those from, from some of the academic collaborators uh, that we've worked with. Uh, as a profession in the past and are currently developing work with um, really uh, started to set the mind towards the, the new forms of interrogating our, our collections and how that where that line is blurred. I think a lot of a lot of this conference for me demonstrated where lines are blurring between um, professional practice and academic practice. Some of the um, some of the uh, research projects uh, that were ongoing. Um, are certainly telling us more about our collections, more about their makeup, more about their historical journeys. Uh, and these are, are very important for us who are, are managing collections, who are communicating the importance of these collections um, to people that are, that are coming in our doors. Um, but it, it does start to, to raise questions over, over where the lines are, where they might be moving to. Uh, most recently, I mean, certainly within the last year or so, um, the AHRC has, has made some very interesting noises uh, that have pushed research libraries um, further into this uh, world of uh, becoming part of a, the, the, the collaborative journey of research, becoming a, a research partner uh, to the point of um, several institutions, including my own, starting to, to rebrand our, our services or our, our reading rooms as research laboratories for the humanities. Um, but you know these things uh, they need to be sustainable as well as was mentioned in the last session i'm just going to throw a link into uh the chat here so i don't have to worry about it so i'm also coming to this conversation with an RLUK hat on as well um RLUK and ahrc have been have been pushing on these conversations and um this this rebranding of research libraries as, as laboratories for the humanities to the point where last year there was um, uh, support from the HRC for infrastructure uh, for, for research libraries. So the capability for collections call that went out that supported uh, a number of different calls to bring in some of the, the kit that we've seen used uh, in some of the papers that were given uh, yesterday and today. And now there's uh, they're doubling down on on um, their investment in people as well. So the, the fellowship call that I've just linked to in the Zoom chat um, is ROUK's, uh, to my knowledge, first investment in the library profession, um, looking to to bring forward research active and um, uh, professionals who want to be part of that research journey to to have time to to do these things. However. It, I, we're, we're at an interesting spot um, with research councils, research council funding, uh, and how that applies to uh, traditional roles within the library. The fellowship call, for example, that's just come out is essentially based on a model of, of time buyout, um, which is something that most of our services aren't really equipped for. You know, if, if, um, if one of my curatorial staff wanted to go down to part time in order to go after the fellowship, we would have to work out how to make up that other half time. So there, there's um, issues ahead um, that have um, the, the, the ramifications of some of these kind of conversations that we're going to have to deal with um, at an institutional level as well as a professional level. I think also we need to consider sustainability, um, again, that was brought up sustainability to rise above research council fads. Um, and to really look at how we can embed things like community engagement, like developers, uh, like research connectivity into our future activity. Um, and I, I think there we need to also think about some of the tech that we heard about, especially today, but also yesterday, um, some of the, the technology, both in terms of, of software as well as hardware, um, what is going to be utility and what is gonna be luxury and where we can look at collaborative partnerships between, uh, as was, was mentioned in, in the final session, between uh, academic research departments 
uh, researchers and um, the, the collection space, and often the collection space being the kind of center of gravity for some of these conversations. Uh, I think here too, we need to, to think about um, disbursement of, of kit uh, and uh, kind of conservation expertise. Bob, Bob raised a very interesting point, a very good point uh, today about uh, not all of us have a conservation studio or a conservation team. And so how can we go on some of these journeys or how can we begin on some of these journeys if we don't have um, the in-house expertise? Uh, and I think um, uh, so the, the um, talk that um, Andrew Beebe and Richard Gamison gave yesterday on the, the spectrometer and, and how technology is now shrinking in size and so could be portable is something that we should think about uh, for some of the other tech uh, that we've heard about as well. Um, but for me, uh, as as uh, somebody who, who loves book guts, uh, you know, I, I think some of the, the, the talks that we heard um, in the last two days, breaking breaking items down into constituent parts, understanding the kind of um, the molecular provenance of, of a cultural heritage item was really exciting. Um, and I think, you know, the, the flip side of that is, you know, how much of that is is research activity and how much of that is core professional activity and where do those lines blur? I think finally, uh, for me, um, there's uh, long term questions about some of the new data that's being gathered, some of the, the, the new databases that are being created. What kind of um, long term preservation needs do these have? Um, you know, is, is this a a digital humanities um, fad that in 20 years time, the data is gonna be inaccessible or will not mean the same thing. How do we keep the data associated with the actual object and make sure that all of the work that's going into um, understanding and picking these things apart or looking at analysis of, of large corpus uh, is something that is uh, accessible for, for long-term. Uh, and, then, and then finally, a lot of this conference pointed at areas where we have skilled up as professionals. We've skilled up our ability to work alongside or to, to be research active. Uh, we've skilled up um, the technology that we use or the ways that we understand and interrogate the collections in our care um, or, or to explore new ways to capture metadata or, or produce metadata. Uh, but I think one of the things that we need to explore too is, is uh, making sure that we ensure the space of traditional skills is still front and center in any of those conversations when talking to senior management. A lot of what we've heard about in the last two days um, from, a, from a, 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 a university library perspective are the things that are very trendy, that are, that are very sexy for senior management um, and will often divert core resources uh, from some of the uh, core activity that still needs to happen at the collections level, conservation, collections management, uh, cataloging. And so there, there needs to be a fine, uh, conversation with uh, across the profession and with senior management as to where we find the balance uh, and where uh, research councils and other uh, grant giving bodies can come into the mix to help support some of these innovative ways versus ensuring that we've got core resource to do what we need to do. I think that's me for now, Helen. Thanks very much, Daryl. And our second speaker is Lara Haggerty. Um, Lara, if you just, yes, great you're here with us. Thanks very much, Helen. Um, I'm not gonna speak as long as Daryl. I think that was su such a, a great overview of everything that's been going on these last couple of days. As a very small library and museum, it's always exciting to hear about ideas and about developments and, and so on. Um, and it, one of the biggest things that I get from attending conferences like this is that bigger picture, that overview. Although sometimes many of my colleagues will say, you know, well, what's the relevance to us when you're talking about somebody that has um, a digital team, for example, that did make me slightly go eek um, when we were um, hearing about some of the, the fantastic work that's going on at the moment and thinking the digital team is like my left arm or something like that. Um, when you're one person um, or even not even a full time worker with a team of volunteers or perhaps just a volunteer run library come museum as we are, getting your, a handle on these things um, is very difficult and participating can be even more difficult. However, my feeling is, uh, after these couple of days is one of positivity. It's not about what 
can't we do? It's about what can we do? And the, the value of events like this and, and groups like this is, of course, the potential for collaboration. Um, certainly from the, the early uh, papers yesterday, I was thinking about how important it would be to understand the background um, for um, light damage, for example, when making a case to trustees or making a, a case to grant funders for the need to spend um, money or to allocate resources to that kind of conservation work. It's not just a case of, oh, we'll just keep trundling along. We've got actual data from other people's um, work that can help us in, in making that case. As we revise our cataloging, which we're doing at the moment, building a new system because our, our catalog has, uh, software has, has died a death. Uh, it, it's such an important reminder to try and gather in as much uh, information as possible uh, and to find ways to make sure that the librarians of, of the future in small places have that information. And whilst the, the potential for pollen um, analysis tracing our borrowers across the countryside was not going to work, sadly. It did strike me that there was a possibility of looking at book provenance. Uh, we're always asking, how on earth did we get this particular book in our collection in a tiny rural library in the middle of the countryside? And perhaps if this has come from abroad, um, there's a little piggybacking on someone else's project that might be done there. Um, Sorry, I'm looking at my notes here and hopefully I'm not just um, fading in and out too much. Finally, my thoughts today were very much about what Inner is going to be doing next year for its exhibition. One of the, the most important things that we have in our collection is our register of borrowers, which records all the people who came here. And recently a book has been published that highlights uh, a man called Robert Sterling, who many of you may know as the inventor of the Sterling engine. This idea um, it came to my attention because the um, Robert Sterling was actually an inner Peffrey borrower. He borrowed in uh, 1806, um, and this was part of, of his life was coming to this little library. And I've been thinking about how innovation and invention could be the theme for our exhibition next year. So this conference was really important to me to not just celebrate the innovation and technology of the past and how that's uh, affected our borrowers and what we might have in our collection, but to see how we might engage with the innovation and technology of the future, perhaps uh, as a collaborator on a larger project, um, perhaps just looking to see if there's something within all of these fascinating uh, ideas that we can bring to our, our tiny little library too. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lara. That was really great to hear your perspective on this. And certainly from my end, your connection held up all the way through. And now over to Tanya. Hi, yes. Um, I think this conference has been so fascinating for so many reasons, and it's really opened my eyes to um, the wealth of stuff that's going on out there, which I think sometimes working in such a big place like the BL, you can get a bit kind of siloed into your own institution so I always find it incredibly helpful um I the thing that I've been thinking about all the way through really is to pick up on something that Bob said earlier which Dara also picked up on which is people who work in institutions where you don't have like a dedicated conservation um laboratory and I think so we're at the BL we're incredibly lucky so we've got not only a conservation center but we've also got two scientists in the conservation center one who's just an imaging scientist so um like multi-spectral imaging um, as a full-time job and another one who's like a more general scientist working with um, research into materials and obviously that is it we're incredibly lucky to have those people and it's like a wealth of resource um, but even so the ability of like specific areas of the BL like uh, my area to access them is kind of limited because it's just such a huge collection so you're always um competing against your colleagues basically to get the um get the time with the scientists and inevitably um quite often some of our really significant manuscripts get more attention because obviously unique items um and we've got really important things like limbs from gospels and things like that which um there's lots of research potential for with conservation science um but it can mean that sometimes printed books 
um, it's kind of harder for us to get in there. Um, but even so, I think there's so much from this that um, I want to kind of pick up on with our our conservation team. So I found the um, all the discussion about microfading just really fascinating, and um, we are involved in loads of loans out to exhibitions all over the world. Um, it's a bit weird at the moment with COVID because the people are cancelling um, lots of them, but I'm assuming that at some point they'll pick back up and just be things going out every week, which is what it was like before. Um, and quite often we are called upon to make calls on whether we think something can go on loan for an extended period, especially as lots of um, exhibitions have uh, had to reduce the numbers of people that are in the space, so they want to have things on show for longer. And that can just be really challenging. We're often making, I think, quite subjective decisions. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we would look at doing microfading on every item, because I think that would be not possible. But um, there's definitely some things in my collection that I would um, be really keen on having that done on, just as like a um, something to know more about that item, especially if it gets requested a lot. Um, so I think that was incredibly helpful. Um, I also wanted to pick up on the pollen um, talk. So um, Catherine Reedy and Eileen Tistel's uh, talk yesterday, um, which has also really made me think about our collections in a new light. So um, as lots of you know, the kind of backbone of the BL collections is legal deposit. So things didn't have a life before they came into the BL, they came straight from the publisher. Um, in lots of cases and although we are buying stuff all the time um, to fill gaps in legal deposit obviously that material you can do any research like that uh, on any of that material really but um, we're increasingly interested in kind of redressing the imbalance that we have through so much of our collection coming from legal deposit so we're thinking much more about like how people are use, how people used books um, in their own lives and trying to acquire collections that have evidence of use um, as a kind of a growth area and it, it really made me um, it really made me think about how you you shouldn't just worry that you've got something that's water damaged but you should see it as an opportunity because that might mean that it's been out in the rain and therefore it might have traces of pollen and that's a research uh, angle so that made me kind of think about turning um, negatives into positives in some situations. Um, and then the final thing I want to pick up in on is the talks about machine learning. Um, so Mike Bennett's talk uh, today. And um, that's really made me think about a lot of work that we do at the BL as well. So we um, have got uh, quite a few crowdsourcing projects that are live. So uh, there's one called In the Spotlight, which is a Playbills crowdsourcing project. We've got 250,000 Playbills and they weren't individually catalogued just because it, you could never do that. Um, the resource would be too much. So this crowdsourcing is creating an index of the playbills. And it made me think about how we could use machine learning to um, require less kind of human input and more just checking. Um, uh, potentially, we could develop it in the future to be more like that. There's a new crowdsourcing project we've got, which is um, tracing adverts of enslaved peoples who um, have run away um, and the people who are trying to cap capture them and what they've said about them. Um, that's just a new one. So again, the same kind of thing. It's um, using OCR of uh, contemporary, contemporary then newspaper accounts. Um, and there's also a massive project at the BL, which is a five year project with the Alan Turing Institution called Living with Machines. So I'm not really very involved in and it's quite hard to explain so I'm going to do a very bad job but um, essentially it's um, using kind of data and machine learning to look at accounts of the ways that um, human beings interacted with the industrial revolution in the 19, 18, late 18th and early 19th century and um, how that can kind of tell us about how humans interact with machines today um, and there will be some kind of traditional outputs about like an exhibition, but also it's like a huge, huge um, AI project that the BL has embarked on, which is bigger than anything we've done before. So I think that it's going to be really exciting to see how we can then incorporate aspects of that into our um, more everyday work. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it for me. 
Thanks very much, Tanya. I'm going to ask all of our speakers, if, as Daryl's just done, turn your um, camera on, um, unmute yourselves, and um, we can have a discussion. And just encourage everybody else, please do put questions in the chat. Please also, sometimes you say, not we'd rather have questions and not your own comments, but this is a session where we actually do encourage, give us your own comments about how you might use this, um, anything you've taken away from this conference, anything you think, um, whether it's RLUK or the Silk Rare Books Group or someone else could work collectively on to provide training or more advice or support. So yeah, comments as well as questions, very welcome. But I'm going to kick off. Um, I asked this question in one of the first conference sessions, and I said I was going to come back to it in the discussion panel. So I am um, right at the start where we heard about these medieval manuscripts and with the pigments that came from Afghanistan and thinking about how these this kind of research question can help us take our collections out to non academic audiences and community groups. Um, and I wanted to ask you from your pers different perspectives about the uses and the user groups you work with, how should we build that kind of output and impact and outreach into these kinds of collaborative projects? I think that's a, a really good point, Helen. Um, some of the most exciting community uh, interaction projects I've seen have been using um, science um, as the, the basis of getting people really actively engaged with what's going on, particularly uh, a book sniffing project I seem to remember about the um, about bindings, which was it was it at Durham, um, where you could get all the, the different parts that were making up um, a book and, and smell them, including things that were used for tanning leather and scraping um, parchment and uh, all of these things. Uh, I was particularly interested in, in this, um, uh, in, in the color connections and whether or not we might be able to have little bits of lapis lazuli and um, azurite and try not to be distracted by the captioning coming up as, as you like every time, every time it said azurite. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sure. So uh, for me, I mean, I, I think um, on your point, Helen, I, I, for me, what I what I like about um, the kind of engagement aspect of working, especially with an academic on a, on a research project who's engaging with the collections, is seeing seeing the way that somebody who is is not necessarily from our professional background, how they might engage other audiences with our collections. Uh, and um, there's, a, there's a lot of joy that personally I derive in those kind of um, interactions, but certainly we, we learn a lot more about our collections and also potential communities that these collections might have resonance with through some of those engagements. So using academics as, as a bridge to some of those communities is really, is really quite exciting. Um, it, it, it's often fun to kind of see uh, an academic who's used to giving academic papers and, and talking to to their peers, then to kind of pivot and and do that you know public talk that you do for an exhibition that's you know that they're, they've co curated or whatever, uh, and sometimes it's a real kind of test of of you know how well somebody can communicate and disseminate and actually you know bring importance to what it might be a very abstract concept to to a public 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 audience. I mean, I think the the point that you made specifically, Helen, in chat about um, relating, you know, how global some of these collections can be seen if you start to, to break them down into their constituent parts, whether that's a journey that a book might have taken or whether that's the materials that have been used to create. Um, and, you know, you can find resonance in, in a lot of different ways um, looking at our, looking at our collections. But yeah, for me, it, it's, it's, it's having that kind of third party and that new lens on, on your material that it's really quite exciting. I totally agree with that. I think I've got so much out of um, talking to academics about collections and, and learning what kind of things they're interested in and seeing it from a non book history perspective, which I think we can easily kind of fall into just seeing things very much as themselves and not evidence of a wider um, historical context. Um, I'm really interested about Lara's mention of the book sniffing thing because we've literally just been contacted by somebody who's doing a book sniffing project which is not the same <laughs> as that one 
I know we have we're having to try and work out how we can facilitate seven people coming to smell a book. <laughs> it's just a new challenge. Um, yeah, but even from how they've described their project, it's it's so interesting to me because it's just not something that I'd ever thought about before. Um, so yeah, definitely getting that outside perspective, I think, is so important. Yeah. I think it is people can tell us new stories that, as you say, we wouldn't necessarily have thought to tell ourselves. There's a think, question. Oh, sorry, Daryl, go on. Sorry, I was just going to add on to that. I mean, for me also, it's really exciting to, to get beyond the kind of uh, the, the limits of the humanities and to get to work with people that are working in kind of hard sciences as well. Uh, it's often a border that, especially in academic research libraries, is quite hard to get over that hump and to actually find somebody that's working in chemistry or, or whatever that might be interested in, in using our collections for the study. And so to see, you know, so many projects that we've heard about in these past two days, whether they're computer science or hard science or experimental science, um, it's great because it's, it's bringing whole new disciplines, academic disciplines to the collections as well. I think that segues very nicely into the question we've got from Bob McLean in chat which is, do we need to have conversations with heritage scientists at the earliest stage pre-research to bake into funding bids for special collections to translate research findings into updated catalogue records and narratives? And maybe we can come back to metadata and think about that a bit more specifically. But he also says, rather than thinking traditional funding sources like the Mellon Foundation, Wellcome Library, AHRC, should we be casting wider to STEM sources and funding councils? Well, there's certainly a lot more money in the science councils. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's the holy grail of funding. <laughs> yeah, I think this can be really challenging because from the kind of um, science type projects I've worked with, um, the, the, the issue of like how to get that into the catalogue records in a way that it doesn't sit oddly with the rest of your catalogue records is, I think, just really difficult. Um, and going back to the Playbills project that I mentioned, part of the reason why we set up that crowdsourcing project was to create this kind of index of data of um, theatres and, and uh, performers and plays. Um, and we're not really sure how that can be put into the catalogue in any other way other than like OCRing the items. Um, like you can't have, you couldn't have catalogue records that were kind of an index. Um, yeah, I, I think it is quite challenging. And I think, the heritage scientists definitely bring a different perspective. So yeah, I agree. I agree, Bob. Can I ask, um, I, we have got quite a few questions now, but I just want to unpick this one a little bit. Um, can I ask you, got you three to talk a bit about the conversations you have with people at when they come to you with a research project? Um, good experiences, bad experiences, what to do, what not to do? I think sometimes you can feel like you're being quite negative because all you end up doing is being like it doesn't really work like that we can't really do this <laughs> yeah the letdown uh, yeah <laughs> yeah it's um uh, i i think it's um i think we're i mean we're at an interesting point because we we, we are i mean uh, certainly within research library seeing a lot more researchers coming to our doors and wanting to do stuff with us which is you know that's what we want um well, there's a real capacity issue, and I, I think a lot of uh, researchers don't necessarily clock that as they're coming, you know, to the library. They don't under be, they're just not exposed to you know what kind of resource that we might have that you could throw at something. Uh, and so again, you know, going back to the kind of standards grant model, be it AHRC or Leverhulme or whoever, this kind of standard model of buying out somebody's time to work on a project, it. it doesn't work really well for, for the library profession. So, you know, there's been a, a couple of bids recently where we've calculated, you know, how much time it would be for a core member of staff to work on this project. And then when that money comes in, then you're gonna have to redeploy that money to um, to support, you know, that core activity. It, it, there's weird things there that don't really work with the way that our, our profession is currently modeled. And I think that's that's the hardest conversation to have because it's very common for academics to buy out their own, you know, to have their time bought out and to, to work on a project and to bring in a, a temporary lecture or whatever, mm -hmm. um, where uh, for us, we don't, uh, one, we don't have that kind of deep pool of people that could drop in and two, that causes all kinds of um, uh, casualty across 
our own profession, which we see as being really problematic within the academic profession. Yeah. Lyra, what about you? Yes. Um... I'm mean, seeing what Daryl's saying very much applies, even though our our, our setup is extremely small. Uh, that kind of, um, we like to say yes all the time. Of course, we do it. We're kind of the access is our big thing. It's at the top of our list for everything we want to do, but it is not possible to give somebody a good quality, um, you know, student placement experience, for example, um, to do research if they are going to need my time if they're going to need to take up the one space that we have that people can sit and actually do research um never mind the the covid restrictions uh, and i was reading that they are just um, mike's question about um opening up the data behind the collection this is so much on my head at the moment because we're recataloging and, and trying to find tanya ways of including all the little bits of information that we come up against when we're with we're showing books and we're relating them to um, borrowing and uh, and other um, you know, purchasing and, and other little bits of data, which is very important to us um, as a library, but might not be important beyond that. Um, and I hadn't even taken the step about how to show that in terms of an exhibition and, and curating it, which is very exciting. And I'm just thinking that my head might explode <laughs> with, the, with the capacity just to be able to try and, and be all things to all people. So you do have to say no. Um, and hopefully you can say no in ways that um, mean that it might be a, a potential for the future that just happens to be that now we can't say no. Uh, buy out of time, which we've had in and uh, not this kind of project, but in other pro projects for us it has just not worked at all. It's just meant that um, we, we actually need more staff, not just diverting one member of staff to something else. Um, it, it's a very tricky one. Um, and I, I like um, I like Bob's baked in de description. I've not come across that that um, term before, but I like it very much. I like that we all run on cake after all. <laughs> and um, the, uh, the, what am I trying to say there? having a place where, um, like a sandbox, where these ideas can be placed so that people are able to make use of contacts um, or you know, to you know, expose ideas and projects to the, the right um, other disciplines is probably the answer, but uh, that sounds like an enormously big project that uh, I don't know who would take it on. Thank you. Can I come in just very quickly, Helen? Yes. Uh, on the, the just the baked in aspect uh, that Laurie mentioned that, that that Bob asked about, I mean I think there, uh, there there's potential, but there's also real danger um, in terms of prioritizing again I, what I mentioned prioritizing the, the kind of new and fancy stuff versus you know a grant is a finite amount of money and you know so much money has to go towards buying out an academic's time. And then you're left over with, you know, do you digitize X number of books or manuscripts or, you know, a, a, a hire a cataloger for a year or whatever, or do you do the fancy, fancy stuff? Um, and I think there, you know, we're still at a point where there's not enough room to do both of those things within most grant calls that we've seen. I think yeah, I'd that, agree with that. <laughs> I think this is where we, as you, I, I can't remember who it was now, someone talked about service. And that's how quite often we see how we engage with researchers that we're providing a service to them. And it's very difficult to step away from that to actually, if we're talking about a collaboration, we're not providing a service to you, we're partners in a collaborative project. Yeah. And reconfiguring that relationship can be difficult on both sides. Which brings me very nicely to Elizabeth Lawrence's question, what can we do to further engage with scientists from the starting point of educating them and what we're about so that they can start to see the links and potential of their own contributions? And I think if you think one thing you would like to do or say or have them know about librarians and libraries and special collections before the collaboration starts. such a massive question <laughs> just pick one thing if there was one thing of all the things that we all know about how we go about our work every day I think the what the absolute one thing that they need to know is that not everything is just digitized and perfect and it's all a big mess you have to try and negotiate it um and the, I was going to say the other thing that I found really helpful so I, one of my really close friends is um a, 
a biologist who's researches into like um, deafness as people grow, grow older and she researches with zebrafish and we quite often read each other's um, uh, kind of introductions and grant proposals and things to make sure that it's understandable to people in the other sector <laughs> which I find really helpful and I think she does as well and it's really like refined my ability to um, talk about jargon in a way that not just like broader humanities people can understand but also science people great um yeah so i mean i just in general i've I found that anytime there's there's somebody who's a uh a scientist in the room they love hearing about their own discipline uh because most scientists uh, they they know the kind of abstract history of their own discipline uh but they often don't have they just don't have the time to encounter themselves with it so you know having a physicist in the room getting out a principia, you know, that kind of explodes minds. And then you, then the conversation, oh, Laura dropped, um, the, the conversation kind of moves on from there. I think for me, the most fruitful conversations I've had with scientists are around data sets uh, and the kind of the raw data that's there in a very raw state, right? You know, whether that's computational or, or physical or, or chemical or whatever, that, you know, the collections that we work with you know, they've been around for a very long time. They've been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And there's all kinds of ways to interrogate that data set and, and create new research projects. And they like that because, that, you know, that's the kind of language they're used to talking. Talking is the kind of sorting through raw data, compiling mm -hmm. into data sets and then, you know, analyzing data, um, which are skills that, that we have as information professionals as well. I think one of the challenges with data sets, though, is that you make them available and then you don't know what people are doing with them and I mean obviously that's fine they can do with them what they want but um you don't get to learn from that necessarily unless you come across things or they tell you which they don't always think to um but we definitely come across projects that people have done with our data we've been like oh this would have been really great to uh, work with you on um but they've just kind of gone their own way which you know they're entitled to do I think that's one of the problems, you know, we want our, we want the data to be re open and reusable, but then the problem is people don't come and ask your permission. Yeah. Anymore. So <laughs> that's what we need the AI to develop, a system that automatically tracks any reuse of it and any any other computer under the sun. Get cracking on it, computer scientists. I, I wanted to backtrack a bit to um, Mike Bennett's question, which is this one about the panel's thoughts on opening up the data behind the collection alongside curated views and presentations and the ideas about new perspectives and openings and then he's yes with the session papers project there was some potential research interest from language researchers who are interested in the fact that there's a collection of broadly similar thematic texts over several hundred years. So they're not really looking for the library curated presentation about here's the things we want to tell you about the session papers. We want to tell you about, we, we just want your data and to work with that. Um, do you have thoughts about that, how to make that available? My, my initial reaction to that is yes, go do it. I mean, it's the kind of thing that Tanya just mentioned. Um, I, I, I guess I'm not so possessive around some of that data, you know, just let it go and, and see what happens. And if it comes back around, then, then great. Um, but to kind of abstract some of Mike's question there too, is that there's, there's kind of data, different types of data behind the collection and some of it, which has been collated historically. So thinking about watermarks and, uh, you know, iconographic binding stamps and these kind of things, which are kind of locked up in mid 20th century early 20th century scholarship and then we've done a lot of work recently you know there, there's ways to, to look at data sets that are about the physicality of these things that you know a lot of that work has already been done this just hasn't been unlocked in the same way and of course you've got copyright issues there too mm -hmm. of, of scholarship done by other people so you know i think that that that's in the mix um i think the uh opening up of data of the you know collections as data uh, which is quite um quite in vogue in the last couple of years um is is really important because i mean we have i mean as, as we just discussed we've got tons of data sets we've got data that is in not particularly um clean uh forms and it, you know I, I think there too there's a conversation of when is it okay to release messy data versus you know highly refined and and collated data 
Yes. I see Lyra has joined us again. Lyra, we're back on to collect uh, data, research data. And I'd be really interested to hear your perspective on this from a smaller library because Daryl has a university, Tanya um, has, and we have similarly have the da data um, foundry or data platform to publish data from our institutions. But how does that work for your kind of library? Mm, uh, mostly through collaboration. I mean, we have a memorandum of understanding with Stirling University, um, and we've worked with them on a couple of AR AHRC, for some reason that acronym always trips me up, sorry, um, projects with, um, with for PhDs and also for um, smaller projects and postdocs. Um, and so the publishing tends to be through them and, and through that um, uh, through that collaboration. And, and that's worked very well for us. Um, but what I'm trying to think about at the moment is how we mesh the, um, the cataloging data that, that we're working on just now with the um, research data, because the two of them are kind of inextricably linked because the, um, for example, if somebody's done a, a piece of work on how many times a book is borrowed, well, why should that be in our catalogue? Because that's actually quite interesting. Um, I've always been desperate to do an exhibition of books that were never borrowed. Uh, and that, um, that would be, you know, why were they never borrowed? Um, but that having that data at my fingertips would make that, that so much easier, but would also be of great interest to, to people who are visiting and researching, uh, whether it's the history of libraries, the history of reading, um, it, all, all of these things, just, they just interconnect, don't they? I think this is a quite, this is where the landscape is changing and maybe the solution is we don't have to put it all in the catalogue that linked data a few years ago it was like well this is very interesting but what are we going to do with it and it seems like that can be a way of making research data and catalogue data speak to each other. I must say my answer to my own question the one thing I would like people to know is we already have metadata systems and standards and we're trying to work to those and we're trying to create interoperable standardized metadata that speaks to the data found in library catalogs all around the world. And I think sometimes that can be the challenge. Somebody comes to you with a very exciting project and of, but and we really want to record this. And yes, but we we don't want to do that because we don't want to put that in our catalog because then that would be for those 10 books and not for the other million that don't have that information in the catalogue record. Uh, so that kind of sustainability and scalability issue, I think is quite important. I just want to loop back to something that Daryl said as well, which I think you kind of touched on Helen as well, which is about copyright. And it's kind of the elephant in the room with this, that you, people can come to you with really exciting projects, but you have to kind of say, sorry, but we can't make any of this available, this data, because it's in copyright. and. Um, you're gonna to have to wait for 40 years <laughs> and that is just really frustrating um then you know obviously copyright is important but yeah sometimes you think we could do so much more if we were enabled to use this data um yeah yes helen can i pick up on on mike's plus one there at the bottom of the chat thread so mike i mean uh, uh, we could have this conversation separately but i think you know this is a a, a a long-standing issue within within our profession is that we trust our catalog. We don't trust anybody else's databases. Um, and I think you know that's the, the kind of the the long-lasting catalog. You know, capture all the essential data. You know, public or or privately visible in a catalog, and you know you've got control of that. Where I think uh, the hesitation is probably justified um, as to you know data about your collection that's held in another place. You know, is that ephemeral you know, how long is that going to last and again who can access that and and who's going to support it in, in years to come so i mean i guess that would be my challenge to to the to the the plus one of of data outside of catalogs um I'm going to change direction a little bit and go to a question from Christine McGowan, which says, I'd like to thank Daryl for acknowledging the tension between sexy new projects involving emerging technologies and retaining proficiency in traditional bibliographical skills. How will we train and recruit new professionals with these radically different specialisms? How do you see this playing out in future staffing models, particularly in smaller institutions with small numbers of staff? 
So I'm going to come to Daryl first on this because he and I have both spent several years now working on um, a project in IFLA, which is competencies for special collections and rare book librarians. And one of the things that motivated us to tackle this question was precisely this point about we have we could have we we have an ever expanding list of things that it would be really nice for people to know about. And how do we make that a manageable body of knowledge for one team or one person? So, Daryl, I'm going to come to you first. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been toying around with that a lot in the last couple of days. Uh, and I think for me, I think what's really important for new professionals, but also current existing, whatever, ongoing professionals is not so much knowing how to do these things, but knowing how to have the conversations. Um, you know, I, I thought the, the talks that we had at the very beginning um, uh, of the, the conference yesterday, breaking down some of the jargon and the acronyms and understanding, you know, wh where that kind of fence line lies between our profession and, and heritage science um, and how to speak some of that language. I think awareness of a lot of these um, techniques, a lot of these activities, a lot of these research methods is something that should be worked into, you know, uh, education of the librarians under, you know, awareness, understanding, but that these are kind of allied, allied to the core skills that we still need as, as librarians. I mean, the, the competencies work that IFLA mentions, you know, it's really having those core competencies to follow a collection item through its journey, through, through a collection, through, you know, ingest or processing, through going out into the reading room and back. And that, you know, a lot of what we've heard today is in the realm, in that kind of realm between that Venn diagram between conservation, collections management cataloging and um, and research um, and so it's it's being aware of the research landscape as much as anything else. Lara what about you I'm not sure if you're um, properly with us or maybe have frozen. She's very still. She's frozen in which case we'll go back to Tanya. Um. Yeah, I think you're right, Christine, it is a real challenge. And I think it, it sounds kind of neat and too neat, but I think it's kind of back to collaboration because I think, um, yeah, if there's one thing this conference has showed, it's that there's loads of different, completely different um, things going on in, in the broad remit of science in rare books in different places and, um, like knowing what's going on and who you can talk to for information about things is just going to be increasingly helpful. I think that in terms of like traditional skills, I mean, I feel like this is a challenge that's, um, that is really present and, ever, and growing more and more present because as um, library schools kind of stop teaching those very traditional skills and people don't necessarily need to go to library schools anymore to get into the profession. Um, I think we need to be better about making sure that we are um, kind of helping people gain the skills they need for um, this kind of sector. Um, and that might be like work placements or um, something a bit more formal. But yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's really important that we remember that it's not all digital humanities and we've all got something to share. Lara, I think you're back with us. We're talking about skills and recruitment. And if you've maybe thoughts on that from your perspective from a smaller institution. You're muted, Lara. That's it. Hello, hello. Um, sorry to keep missing bits, folks. The skills, you said. Skills and recruitment and the balance, all this new stuff that we've just been hearing about versus all the traditional things that you still need to know because we're still looking after collections of historical books. Uh, it's, I mean, it's very much the, you know, ambulance chasing a syndrome, isn't it? Is that you can get money to do exciting things or you can get money to bring in, um, you know, a digital marketing executive, um, but you can get somebody to do very ordinary things that are, of course, essential. And for us, that kind of grassroots stuff is really important, whether it's just somebody who opens the door but knows how to do all the other 
um, the bits and pieces or you know the joy of having somebody who is a real expert on rare books. Um, I think that small institutions will suffer just as much as the larger ones because of, of the difficulties that this is um, this is giving us all the time. Yeah. I'm looking in the chat and seeing um, some praise for Team Pigment and um, it, as a model project, in fact, for, for high praise from rare book librarians about how to collaborate. And I do think some of the things we've heard at this conference have been um, from people who clearly have put a lot of thought into these collaborations. And I mean, we don't think we want to send you a lot of shining examples of how to collaborate with libraries and special collections. Helen, uh, can I just jump in uh, on the back of what Laura and, and Tanya were saying there in terms of um, new new professionals or, or kind of professionals in development? I think it's it's really important, especially as we're getting into this realm of, of librarians as, as part of the you know, research collaborators, that we do have a place of authority in that partnership and that, that authority still lies with our collections knowledge and our ability to work with the collections that we have, you know, whether that's printed books, manuscripts, whatever. <laughs> Uh, those traditional skills uh, need to be taught. You know, they need to to come out of out of um, pre qualification you know, pre um, pre course um, uh, work placements and internships. They need to come out of um, the educational journey, and then and then you know, making sure that ground level jobs are there that that have those elements built into them. Because if if you go into a research collaboration kind of um, conversation and you're not seen as a kind of authority on the collection to be able to speak to, you know, why your collection is important or your kind of physical makeup of your book or whatever, and that puts you on the back foot. So I think that some of those traditional skills are, are really core to our profession and they will continue, they're not going away. I'll fly that traditional skills flag for as long as need be. One of the most useful sessions I ever attended at a conference was one about linked open data for people who will never be the person in their library who does the linked open data, but who need to know what it is. And I think more of that kind of awareness raising is like, you're not necessarily going to be the person who does the coding. You're not necessarily going to be the person who trains the neural network, but it's, you need to know enough about how, how long does it take? Who would you be? Who would be a good person to collaborate with? Where would you find these people? Mm -hmm. um, what how, what kind of resourcing would you need to put into that so that we can have the dialogue that sets the project up properly? Um, I think maybe we've got time for one more question, and I'm not seeing anything in the chat you have got one last opportunity to put a last question in but I am going to ask one of my own and that is about um, this question about research and scalability and consistency and research original research is about originality and pursuing something that a thought nobody has had before and like working out an idea or hypothesis that hasn't been had before and then we would like to take that and then say add it into our own great now we know now we understand that and now we'd like to do that kind of analysis or that kind of data create that kind of data across all of our collections so that it can be used by other people and I guess I've never quite squared that circle of how you go from the original exciting research project to, and now can we just put the rest of our manuscripts through that analysis? Or, and can we just, can we just run all the rest of our digitized collections through that AI? And I wondered if you had thoughts about that and about maybe conversations we could have through RLUK, through SILUP, through the AHRC to address these questions. so hard but i have made some things business as usual isn't it and <laughs> i i feel like um a lot of these projects uh, do really take quite a long time and so the thought of trying to do that for the whole of um my collections is very traumatic <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that is it's such a challenge i don't i don't have any insights <laughs> sorry <laughs> I think the, the, the challenge, uh, I, I hate to keep coming back around to this, but I, I think the challenge is in the kind of funding models and the way that, I mean, you know, academic research by it, it's kind of uh, any 
kind of research question is is push through several crucibles in order to kind of understand is it unique and what are the questions and how can I refine these things and as professionals we often don't have that kind of headspace to deal with these things but when we do or as we develop new tools or new techniques or new technology to understand our collections or to produce new data about collections the process and the product of that is something that is um that's not necessarily understood as a kind of research output or is only now being recently understood as a research output. Um, so, I mean, going back, just because I'm most familiar with it, the what Mike was talking about with the session papers, I mean, what he was talking about is something that in abstract could be applied to tons of different collections. I mean, we were just talking about the the, the broadsides and ballads collections. Mm. You could chunk that through, you know, a, a very similar system and run it through. Um, but has um, that tool and, and the work that, that Mike has done gotten a massive HRC grant to do that work? No. Um, it, and, and that's, you know, that there's, you know, questions remain and, you know, we'll see how things go in the next couple of years. But, uh, you know, uh, my, my other question is, as a collections owner, I have my own questions about the collection that I would love an academic to come and work on. I don't have the bandwidth or the time or necessarily the, the expertise to do some of these things, but I would love to go to someplace like AHRC and say, look, we have this research question. Uh, would you put up the funding for us to advertise, to recruit a researcher to come in and do the work with us? And I think that may be a model worth exploring in time. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, linked to that, um, we have collaborative doctoral students now, so they are uh, uh, jointly supervised by the British Library and um, univ a university and I know lots of other kind of cultural bodies have them as well and that has been super useful because you can you can you, you can't specify exactly what they should do for their PhD but you can give them like a broad area um, and then you know that the material that you want to be worked on will get worked on in some way and there will be some kind of output which will help you know more about your collections or what you can do with them so I think that has been really positive. Yeah, I think the British Library does a really good job of putting out quite clearly these are the research things we're interested in and perhaps as an example more, more of us should follow, you know, along with all the other information we put on the website about our collections. And by the way, here are five questions we'd really love somebody else to come along and answer for us. Yeah. Um, I think maybe it's time to wrap up our um, session, but um, I'm going to give myself the last word um, to kind of, it's a hard job to sum up our entire conference, but I think some of the things that we've learned really, um, science is counterintuitive, who knew that felt tip pens were the really fragile element that was subject to micro, to, to subject to fading over time. Science can give us good baseline info. As Mike Bennett says, it can do the heavy lifting. It can't do everything. Sometimes it won't answer the question that we want answered. Did this book go to Jerusalem? Well, the pollen can't tell us that specifically. Sometimes it needs our input. It certainly needs our ethics. Science changes, which I think is always something for us to bear in mind. When I started off working with rare books, I was told that OCR was great, but it would never be of any relevance to special collections because you couldn't OCR our kinds of texts and you certainly couldn't OCR our manuscripts and that's changing. Science costs money. Um, we heard it costs 300 pounds a day for the, to, to buy the time and the access to the microfader. Training neural networks doesn't come on the cheap. Do your users have the equipment to access the stuff once you've done it? Science does enable us to understand new things, tell new stories, engage with new people, unlock collections, but it might also raise new issues. Um, we heard in the last session quite scarily about the potential that artificial intelligence can have to creating new forgeries, even as it can unpick old forgeries. Um, it creates questions about resourcing and upskilling that we've just been talking about. But we also heard that the researchers, the conservatives and the experts want to collaborate with us, and, but they do need us as well. And I think here's Sarah Maharta's point in the chat, which is it's good to value our own unique skills, which will not be found in other professions, as well as the unique skills of the scientists, which we don't have, is really important. We do have something to contribute. We understand the metadata. We understand the significance of the stuff. We understand what risks we want to take. We understand what lines we want to draw. 
is it worth putting that photograph on display, but not worth sacrificing even one thread of this fabric for a research project? Or maybe we might make the decision the other way around. We can set our collections in context. We can play a key part in recording and curating this knowledge for future use and taking it out to the world. And I think my big takeaway from this conference is that there's a really powerful future for these collaborations between those of us who hold rare books and special collections and all of the wonderful people who can bring their knowledge and ideas and research to bear on them. So with that, we'll wrap this panel session up. Huge thanks to Daryl and Tanya and Lara for giving us their perspectives and summing up the conference for us. And now I think we're going to hand over to Sarah Maharter to give us the final word on things. Thank you very much, Helen, and thank you all of our speakers for that um, amazingly insightful um, panel discussion um, summing up the conference. I have a few reflections of my own, which I'll, I'll just um, share as, as um, I can at the end of the, of the conference. So um, uh, the, yesterday morning, I posed a few questions and said, you know, the way that we might answer these has, has been um, impacted and has developed through the appliance of science. Um, and I certainly think that our speakers have shown us um, how that's applied over the last couple of days. Um, and I, I was also talking about how we might learn how to apply um, some of this science to our roles. And I think what we've just uncovered, particularly actually in the panel discussion, is how we can also apply our roles to the science um, and, our, and work in that collaborative approach, which will lead to um, richer engagement and um, deeper understanding of the impact of our collections. Um, I think also one of the uh, key um, findings of this conference um, is that not everyone has access to our collections and the, um, the knowledge that they contain in an equal way. That, um, that sort of digital divide is very clear and has become clearer over the last couple of years. And it is our responsibility as well as everyone else's to, to try and overcome that and find ways to work through and around that and to improve the situation as much as we can. Um, I think, um, you know, we, we've touched on the social justice agenda in, in a few ways and, you know, how we can reach out to um, to our communities through our collections. Um, Helen again picked up on the, you know, the Lazio Lapulai, um, la, sorry, I haven't said that right, but Lapis Lazuli from um, Afghanistan as a, as a way of being able to reach out to communities, which is um, fascinating. And the ethics, you know, do we keep the squashed bugs or do we let them be worked on? Do we do we um, take the sample to, to look at the dyes? Um, a number of the points that Helen has, has just made. Um, I love the fact that we had so much graph envy this morning, looking at things that are you know close to our hearts that maybe we look at and think about in, in a relatively unique way. <laughs> you know, we know that we need to preserve um, our collections in good environmental conditions for the next generations of scientists, researchers in all fields. That really matters to us, <laughs> um, and um, and the, and the machine learning and and what that can can do, how that can take us forward. Um, I've been firing off emails to colleagues over the last couple of days. Saying, oh, I think we should look at this. You know, let, let's when the when the slides come out and the recordings are available, I'd like you know I'd like you to look at this particular recording. Um, you know, how can we improve our cataloging? How can we use searching within our digital collection sites? Uh, you know, for example. So um, how we can apply these things to our own work has really come across quite strongly in the last couple of days. So I think that brings me to the opportunity to thank so many people. Um, I mean, thank you to all of our speakers for all of that wonderful content um, and for generously sharing your knowledge. Um, this, this profession, these professions are so generous um, and that, that is something that, that we um, experience every time we have a conference and outside of conferences, whenever we share information on email lists and, and through our professional practice. So, um, so thank you to all of our speakers for taking the time to prepare. As Bob said, we had hoped to do this conference in Glasgow last year. So thank you for hanging on um, and um, delivering your papers online this year instead. Um, and everyone who's made a contribution, all, all of the chairs, all of the members of the committee who have generously chaired and supported 
one another in this online environment um, and professionally dealt with the odd fallout of dropout of, of um, network connectivity. Thank you again to our sponsors who have helped us to, um, to set up the, the Hoover platform, who have um, supported our activities to um, make this conference possible. Um, a particular thank you and a shout out to um, Christine McGowan and Bob, McHugh, Bob McLean, who have tirelessly put the, together the technology, who have um, worked through all of the setups, um, kept the show on the road in the last couple of days. Um, I hope that you um, get to have a big sigh of relief this evening and um, an extra pleasant evening with whatever you wish to do. And um, I believe that uh, if you haven't already received um, something, then um, a token of the committee's appreciation is winging its way to you by email. So um, I hope that you can enjoy using some vouchers um, for whatever you want to use them for. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, now, a couple of other things to say, um, looking forward um, to future business. Normally we have our um, AGM as part of our annual conference. Last year we held that separately, this year we had decided also to hold that separately, so it will be later in the year and you'll, you'll hear about that um, shortly. Um, and um, within that we will also um, uh, talk about changes to personnel um, on the committee. It's time for a number of us who have held roles on the committee to step down and give others the opportunity. Actually, it would have happened last year in normal times, but we've kept on for a bit of continuity. So um, most significant, um, well, no, not most significant. One of the one of the significant changes is that the chair's role will change. Um, I've been in the chair's role for nearly four years now, actually. So come January, we will change. And um, I'm delighted to say that the current vice chair has agreed to step up to the chair's position. So, um, so that's Lucy, Lucy Evans, whom you will all know, I'm sure, and who's also taken a leading role in many of our conference organizations, including this one. So congratulations to Lucy. Um, so we'll make further announcements later in the year about changes to personnel on the committee. Um, our next conference, um, we plan to hold in person. So we hope that external circumstances will allow us to do so. I suppose if they don't, we have experience of doing it online. We can always you know, attempt to fall back to that if we, if we can do that instead. But the plan at the moment is for us to meet at St Hilda's Co College in Oxford from the 7th to the 9th of September 2022. So why don't we all put that dates, those dates in our diaries and hope that we can. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone there. Um, I suppose one of the advantages of being online is that so many people have joined us from around the world um, and it would be great to think that you can join us in Oxford next year as well, um, whether that's really or virtually, so maybe we ought to give some thought to um, how we can build something into our conference, even if it is in Oxford. Um, and finally, I just wanted to say, um, uh, some of you will probably be aware that the committee has um, has stepped up its advocacy role in the last year or so. It's always been strong in that, um, but there have been several occasions recently where we have felt it was important, imperative really, to, um, to make a statement, to make a stand, and to, um, to speak to um, bodies who were considering reducing their library heritage curatorial capability and capacity. Um, and we have been doing that throughout the year whenever it has felt necessary and whenever it's felt that we would have something to add to that um, contribute or you know add to that debate or contribute to those discussions and consultations. Um, one of the outcomes of that is, um, is a manifesto that sets out uh, what we would hope um, to do or how we would guide people to have discussions, open discussions, open honest discussions in difficult circumstances to try and reach equitable outcomes. Um, and that manifesto has been um, published on the um, Rare Books and Special Collections Group pages in the publication section uh, during the conference. So I'd urge you to go and have a look um, to see um, 
to read it for yourselves and um, to see whether it's useful. And I think I'm going to put that into the chat. There you are. Hopefully that's just gone in so you can click and have a look. Um, we will, of course, always continue our advocacy role. I would hope that we wouldn't have to do it quite so strongly in such difficult circumstances as time goes on. Um, but we are prepared to step up and say things when we feel it's necessary. Um, so I think um, that might be all I have to say. Committee members do step in if I fail to add something. Um, but once again, thank you all for participating. Um, thank you everybody for um, being here with us for the last couple of days. Um, thank you to all of the people who have made a contribution in um, delivering, in organising, in overseeing um, and in supporting us throughout the two days. Um, and if I could find the applause button on here, I think I would start to give everyone a big clap. We could end with the traditional, thank you, well done, end with the traditional applause to everyone for a fantastic and insightful conference. Thank you very much. <laughs> Others have found it, well done. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>